Hello and welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 252, Job Interview Performance Psychology, Writer's Block, and Changing Your Coaching Philosophy for Uncoachable Players, question mark. Those are the questions for today. Remember, you can call in your own question to the show by going to anchor.fm slash Weldon Green slash messages. I think the link will be below this video on YouTube or somewhere else in the video. It'll be written out. And you can always catch the show live on twitch.tv slash mindgameswelden, where I am doing it right now. Hello, Twitch chat. And uh, usually do it uh, and answer Twitch chat questions before and after the show. So if you want to come there, please join us. Let's jump into the first question from Corey. Hey, I have an interview tomorrow with a QA consultant analyst position with Aetna. I'm just hoping for some interview tips. It's about three and a half times my salary I'll be getting currently. All right. So I, I like this question because it hits at the applicability of sports psychology as it has now started to shift around to other fields. So sports psychology started in, I think, the 60s, maybe a little bit earlier, kind of as a formal field, and mainly in the USSR and then in America maybe shortly thereafter, around the same time. I'm a bit murky on the on the very, very beginnings. Uh, but I know that the push from it was, you know, within the last, uh, within the last uh, 60, 70 years. And it's come to be more and more around uh, the idea of performance psychology. In fact, they're talk, there's, a, there's open debate about changing the name of the field from sports psychology to performance psychology because the principles that are uncovered and that were discovered in the pursuit of sports psychology apply equally well to situations like music, performance, um, public speaking. Uh, even some of the therapies are used in things like uh, when people have uh, performance issues for sex and, and stuff like that, which is also a performance moment. So this is kind of a wide ranging field. And the fact that the principles apply or the ones that actually are about performance psychology and not sports psychology apply equally to job interviews is no surprise. So I guess the fundamental precepts of performance of any performance would be to lean into the pressure. So the pressure is getting to you and instead of trying to avoid it or lower the pressure or escape from the pressure, you lean into it, meaning that you anticipate it, hunger for it, see it as amping you up instead of freaking you out. The butterflies in your stomach are not nerves. The butterflies in your stomach are the pre-performance chemicals, like getting your adrenaline ready so that you can answer your questions better than if you didn't have the adrenaline. I think that because it's a seated thing, it's very similar to video game performance where you're going to need to not, you're not amping yourself up and carb loading and like putting a ton of caffeine in your body so that you can get fast off the starting blocks like you would for a sprint, but rather you're trying to maintain an equilibrium. So you're going to want to do a little bit of Make sure you're breathing well, you know, don't overload on caffeine, maybe mix it in with tea or take some L-theanine to mix with your caffeine so that you're not jittery, but rather you're just calm and focused uh, and fast and snappy. Um, always pause and collect yourself before you jump into the answer so that you kind of know what it is that you want to say. Take that moment of space, find the space within the interview to, to think things through and aim for a solid performance rather than the quick witted uh, retort, right? So instead of just trying to instinctively say the first thing, like make sure it's what you really want to say when you want to say it. Um, I think that there was a, if you've ever watched Froggen, who was a uh, really old school player, who's currently on Golden Guardians in the LCS, he was one of the few players at the beginning of the game that used skill shot markers instead of quick cast. And he said at the time, now, of course, he uses quick cast as just everybody, right? But at the time, he said, it doesn't matter if I can shoot the skill shot faster if I miss it. I'd rather shoot one accurate skill shot than miss like 10, you know, or even miss one uh, when you're in a clutch situation. So he would always use indicators and understand that he was a bit slower, but more accurate. And with that principle, he was able to, you know, conquer the world more or less and even go five games against a Korean uh, championship team in one of the early uh, tournaments in uh, uh, tournaments in Korea. All right, so that's essentially 
Yeah, that's basically it. Find your space. Uh, make sure that you are leaning into the pressure and mm, take a few deep breaths. Nothing really, uh, you know, extravagant. There's not really science around it. Uh, that is, uh, that is like imagery based, you know, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, the problem with most of the techniques that I would recommend is that it takes long periods of training for them to have a sort of discernible effect within the performance. So most of it is irrelevant if you have an interview tomorrow. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, mainly what I recommend. Okay, announcements. We just clinched playoffs. Go CLG. And I think that's about it. I missed a day of streaming and I almost missed today too, except I stayed late after the game to stream it. So we're going to have basically, this is supposed to be a daily show, but I can't really guarantee that given how crazy my life is when I have a full-time job and the kids. It was a lot easier to do when I'm just a consultant. So we'll keep attempting that. And if I miss a day, please forgive me. All right. That's about it for announcements. Let's jump into question number two from Timothy. Hey, do you have any tips on getting over writer's block? I feel as though I have lots of cool ideas and my mind is running a mile a minute whenever I'm walking around or lying down. But when I sit down to write, my mind goes blank and it feels like I'm pulling teeth to get anything out. Thanks. All right, so believe it or not, I used to teach a course at the University of Uvascula for a number of years on, on performance psychology for writers, basically how to get over writer's block. So for them, the first thing to do was, were, was we worked on identity. A lot of them were researchers, or they were scientists, or they were sociologists, or they were psychologists, um, but they didn't really identify as writers. And so I just confronted them, and I was like, hey, how is it that you get paid? We're like, oh, well, you know, I do my research. And I was like, no, how is it you get paid? And they were like, okay, well, you know, the university gives me a salary. And I was like, okay, well, what would cause you to get more salary or what would cause you them to stop higher paying your salary? Like, what are the physical reportable things that they see that metric whether or not you get paid or not? And they're like, publishing articles. I'm like, so you're a writer. You're a paid writer. You perform, you, you produce a piece of writing and you get paid for it. All the stuff that goes into it, that might be your actual job and your career and expertise. But like at the end of the day, you're a paid writer. They were like, no, I'm not. I was like, okay, well, for this class, you are. And they were like, yeah, you're right. Okay. For the intents and purposes of that, it's actually true. This is the producible, discernible impact or effect of like what I do. So what you need to understand, Timothy, is like ideas in your head are very irrelevant to uh, the world and to the act of writing. Lots of people have ideas in their head and yours are special and you have them, but translating ideas in your head to the page is what a writer does. It is the job and skill and act of writing and it is a, it is a job and it is a skill and it is something you get better at with practice. So if you have great ideas, but no production of them, then you need to work on that skill and so I would start by assigning like an identity to yourself being like, okay, I want to be a writer. What I want to acquire is the skill of uh, very cleanly and with exceptional uh, prose translating the ideas that I have into something that brings a reader through an adventure that like I see and feel in my head before they go through it. Like you're preparing, right? Once you see that as like, that's the thing that you want to do. Then the second thing I do is like I would erase the idea of writer's block from your mind because that brings about this mentality that writing is some sort of like mystical gift from some muse or something or from like the essence of the earth or whatever it is from the air and that you're a conduit or a channel and then all you have to do is exist with the idea and a piece of paper and it somehow poofs onto there. But that's not really how it is. What it really is is you have like these con concepts, you must translate them into language. You must remember that language long enough to like get it out on a page, construct good sentences, choose prose, 
deal with alliteration, deal with plot, deal with description, deal with all the stuff that like isn't contained within the idea that you have, but you must build around and within your writing, uh, word choice and all this stuff. And when you're writing, of course, um, all of this is sweaty work. It's effortful work. It's stuff where you got to like drink a bunch of caffeine, make sure you get good sleep. Uh, you know, it's it's your work for the day. And after four hours, you're going to be exhausted. And the other things you want to do that day should be like recreational, right? That kind of work. I mean, like the kind that actually uses your fuel. Um, and once you have that mentality around it, then you can start doing things like, all right, I'm going to work for 30 minutes. I'm going to go on to uh, writing blogs like those groups and blogs by Brandon Sanderson and his friends. Um, and uh, I think Nani Rimo. There's all sorts of like different uh, sci-fi and fantasy writing communities around which people are always writing short fiction. Um, you can learn all sorts of things about how a lot of writers will do um, just like keeping the juices flowing stuff where they'll just have writing prompts and they'll write every single morning about some nonsense thing that has nothing to do with their thing. And, and I think that for me, that would be the first kind of set of steps. If you've already done that, I apologize. I can't really get the context on you from your question. So that, that would be my starting point because that's just my assumption. Please come back and give me another question. If you've spent years as a writer and you're already a member of all those communities and you already do a lot of short fiction and you already write writing prompts, you know, every couple of days. Um, if you already do go through all those kind of like activities and exercises and then put your question like in that context and then I can take the next step after that. Because believe me, I have a lot of material since I, like I said, I used to teach a course on that. All right. Thank you for that wonderful question. I get to go back to that phase in my life. It was really fun teaching that class actually. All right. Uh, speaking of classes, this is the Mac program. This is a class that I teach online. It's composed of 49 online videos that take you through mindfulness, acceptance, commitment, which are the three parts of the process of mental resilience in performance that contains a lot of stuff that would be applicable, for example, in uh, Corey's job interview, but that need training, that need time and a certain like perception uh, and education to take effect. And so I started selling this course on the internet in 2015, and this is about the third version of it. It's currently a little patchy because it references some little activities and stuff that are not necessarily below the videos anymore, since this is uh, the second iteration of a broken website that I'm like limping to. Um, but all of the videos are there, and this is actually where all of the, the changes, the important stuff that's measurable in the brain takes place. So the essence uh, and the most important aspects of the class exist. It's just a few worksheets here and there that are missing. Uh, and I'm not replacing those because I'm basically spending all of my time turning this into an app where everything will be not uh, like this separate kind of course experience, but more encoded as, a, as, an, interactive, uh, as an interactive app with a bunch of content and tools in it. So for now, that's where my focus is, which is why if you want to get the course now, you'll essentially, same as always, you'll be getting access forever, which means when the app comes out, you'll be jumping right into it um, just with permanent lifetime access. That's kind of the way that I do it then. Uh, although that will probably be going away when the app comes out since the app is going to move towards uh, apps take money on a regular basis to maintain. So it's more of a subscription kind of thing usually for apps. But anyway, now's your chance. Check it out. It's at mindgames.gg slash MAC. And you should use the code AskWeldon to show that you came from YouTube and get the $5 discount that goes along with it. All right, let's jump into the last question of the show from Scott. Do you have any examples from your career where you had to change your approach, philosophy, or coaching style in order to motivate a team or player? And what were the results of making this change? Alternatively, were there ever any players that you found you couldn't connect to and properly motivate? And if so, how did you try to connect with that player or did you ever? All right. Thank you, Scott, for that great question. So, yes, there have been players that I have not been a good enough coach to coach. And... That is basically the way that I see it, right? I don't think that players are 
uncoachable. I think there are certainly players that have very difficult backgrounds. And there are players that are difficult with specific coaches to work with and not for others, etc. Kind of depending on the coach's style and their own background, how much rapport they can build with that person. And for me, definitely, there are a number of athletes that are difficult for me to work with and challenge me to become a better coach. And 100% always you should be adapting, improving, and changing your philosophy to kind of help motivate players in the way that they need to be motivated. Not, it doesn't necessarily need me to change my philosophy. So philosophically, I'm basing a lot of the my coaching philosophy on scientific findings. So just because a player is a uh, difficult or different or comes from a, from a challenging background or has a challenging structure in the way that they approach the idea of coaching and stuff, that doesn't invalidate science, which just says this is what motivates people and this isn't. And so I don't really need to change my philosophy. It's more like I need to get better at technique and the applied aspects of like bringing that philosophy to life, right? So there's a lot of adaptation there between the techniques, the drills, and the ways that I interface with players and how much bravery I have for conflict of certain styles. So it really is just more like this is happening every single day a hundred times in little moments here and there, and I'm always constantly striving to do it better. I think that would be a better way to... I mean, I think that that's essentially the answer to your question, is that yes, constantly, tens to hundreds of times per day, and that is the act of coaching and, and coach development, is what you just described. So any, I think coaches that are static and don't change, first of all, they aren't really coaches. They're, they're just people who happen to be doing coaching while they're preparing for some other career, maybe. Um, and then people who think that that's the way coaches are also are incorrect, just FYI. And I'm not saying that you're, you're wrong, blah, blah, blah. What I'm saying is, that you should have a perception of a coach as somebody who is constantly taking a philosophy that is true and universal usually and then and then trying to uh, figure out and develop techniques uh, to apply it and and help to modify the behavior of any person that they come across that is within their scope right on their team or or whatever that they have to so it's about it's it's just about that Um, and that's kind of like an art if you think of it that way the meshing of behavior modification for an individual and your philosophy uh that's that's where the artistry of of coaching is and that's what that's what coaches who love coaching really love is that kind of is that thing that constant thinking about it and doing that so yeah that uh gave me a chance to give a spiel about coaching and coaches so thank you for that question hope the answer was interesting and as always call in your questions anchor.fm slash Weldon Green slash message. Uh, you can find the link below this video or online. And thanks for tuning in the show. I will see you guys tomorrow. Make sure to check out the MacBook.